Greetings, everyone. We're in the process of studying the miracles of Jesus. We're going to continue with that. I don't believe we can talk enough about Jesus. When we read these miracles, we can glean a lot of historical information, a lot of the reasons why he did what he did, and, and the thoughts and things that went into this, this prayer. And I can talk about Jesus all day long, and these never-ending miracles to me is more about what it's all about, which is Jesus Christ. As I've said before, we can hear preachers preach on everything under the sun. That's what they want to do. That's fine. But, it, you know, throw in Jesus Christ. Make him the point. Make him the author of everything that we do. This is one of the miracles of Jesus. You'll find it in Luke chapter 17. And this is where he raised the widow's son. In other words, the widow was a widow, not married. Uh, her husband was deceased, of course. She had a son, and that son was, was dead. So we'll begin with a prayer and end with a prayer. So let's bow our heads and ask that the Lord come into this meeting today to help us to understand, to grow in the Word, grow in Jesus Christ and, and all things for His glory. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you today in the name of your Son, Jesus, through and by the power of the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. Lord, we ask that you take every part of my spiritual being and use it for your glory today. Those that's listening, Lord, take control of their spiritual being and let us, let us glorify you, Lord. We know that with ourselves, within ourselves, we can do nothing but through prayer, reading the Bible, so on, so forth. We can grow intensely in, in the understanding of you, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. Amen. And it came to pass soon after, they, then he went on his way into a city called Nain. That's speaking of Jesus. Many of his disciples going along with him, also a large crowd. Now we know that Jesus called 12 disciples, which were after his resurrection were apostles but he had many disciples in other words a lot of people that heard him today we may say those disciples we can give it another word and that's missionaries uh, and going with him and also a large crowd so we see a mix of jesus disciples missionaries whatever the case may be and a large crowd not small now when he drew, drew near the gate of the city Behold, stop, there was one being carried out as one who had died and only son of his mother. It's at the gate. And this woman was a widow and a sizable crowd from the city was with her. So this drew attention to the fact that the child, the boy had died and that Jesus was there and Jesus will always be there. So sometimes when we pray, we think, Lord, where are you? And can't reach and everything. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he was standing at the gate as well. And the Lord, having seen her with his physical eyes, was moved with compassion for her and said to her, Stop weeping. Now we see in Revelation where John was weeping and he kept on weeping. And the angel said to him, stop weeping. In other words, this lady was in, she was in a great deal of, of what, what is going on. I've lost my son. Now I have no husband. Maybe she had a daughter. I don't know. The Bible doesn't speak of that. But he had compassion on her and he said to her, stop weeping. So that tells us that in our time of weeping, which we all do, I do, Jesus is still there. He hasn't gone anywhere. Having approached, he touched a coffin and those who were carrying him, and it came to a standstill. In other words, they, some way they recognized him as the Son of God, the Messiah, and when he touched it, maybe they considered him a prophet. I don't know. But when he touched that, that coffin, there, everything came to a complete standstill. And he said, young man, to you I am saying, arise at once. Now he's talking to that child in that coffin, which is dead, but now he's speaking to him. And the dead man sat up and began to be speaking, 
and he gave him to his mother. Now, I saw something the other day that kind of bothers me, and I will bring it out now. I saw a well-known evangelist on TV the other day. I just was flipping through the channels for a couple of minutes. And he said, we don't need to see miracles anymore. We have the Word of God. Yes, absolutely the Word of God. And that bothered me, and I want to tell you why. If a person has a bad disease, and it may take their life, they need a miracle. So don't tell Jesus to stop performing miracles. That's a problem. That's a problem I run to quite often. I'm getting excited. People don't believe in miracles anymore. No, that was for the apostles. And no, it's not for everybody else. Well, Paul wasn't didn't walk and talk with Jesus, but Jesus gave him that authority to raise the dead. Stop saying, stop almost blaspheming that God doesn't do miracles. For Give me a reason why he doesn't do it. Give me a scripture. Give me two. Give me three. Let's talk about it. There's lots of people that I know, including myself, that could use a miracle. And to say an evangelist, well, we don't need to see miracles anymore. We've got the Bible. Yes, we've got the Bible, but I still want to see miracles, and I've seen them. And a fear took hold of all, and they glorified God, saying, A prophet, a great one. And now they recognize that, calling him a prophet. He has risen up among us, and God has looked upon his people and has come to their aid. Now they're beginning to worship him and say, You're a prophet. And as I said earlier, did they recognize him as the Son of God? I have no idea. I was not there. And this word went out, in the whole, out into the whole Judea concerning him, and every place in the surrounding territory. Now, on that, we would be surprised that we may witness to someone or a group of people for a long time, and it just doesn't seem like that we're making any progress in seeing them come to Jesus Christ, repent, whatever the case may be, glorify God. But here, believe me, our testimony does go out. So don't be afraid at McDonald's to say, God bless, thank you for taking my order. Only Dr. Luke records this incident. It concerns a restoration to life, as to some would call it, a resurrection. Now, when he raised Lazarus, that was a form of resurrection, but we want to understand clearly that Jesus was the first and only one raised in the glorified body. I've made that clear in other things. In other words... This man here, boy, whatever he was, at some point in time would also have to seek death. It would come and find him. So it was a form of resurrection, but he was raised in his earthly body. Now, if he later on was saved and, and claimed Jesus as his Savior, then he would be raised in the resurrection with a glorified body. The instances recorded of Jesus raising people from the dead technically are not resurrections as we think of them. All the Lord did was restore back life into the old bodies. Tradition says that after the Lord raised Lazarus from the dead, that's Mary Magdalene and Martha's brother, Lazarus asked him if he would have to die again. Our Lord told him he would have to die again. And Lazarus never smiled from that day on. Now, that's just something that uh, may be true or not. I also heard that, that when Jesus was resurrected and he met with Peter, that every time that Peter would hear a, a cock crow, he would, he would weep. There's many things in my life that I weep about, as I said earlier, but they're put into the hands of Jesus. I've lost loved ones. It hurts. It hurts this body. It also hurts you spiritually because some of them were like, they were like mentors to me. They took me under their arm, under their wing, and, and helped me to understand Jesus a whole lot more. So we all weep at one time or another. Whether or not that tradition is accurate concerning Lazarus, I can imagine that going through the doorway of death once would be enough. So when people say, I've never heard anybody been raised from the dead, uh, dead and raised to life and will be dying again, we all will, will experience that or the resurrection. 
Up to this day, only one person has been raised from the dead and resurrected, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the first fruits of them that slept, that sleep. He is the only one raised from the dead in a glorified body. Now, the writer says, I don't know what I'm going to look like, but I know that I'm going to look like him when I get to heaven. I believe to this day, we don't know, but I believe the nail prints are still in his hands. There's instances where the disciples of Mary didn't recognize him, and then when she started speaking to him, then she recognized him. So that meant that there had to be a physical seeing of the Lord Jesus Christ in a body that he had had for 33 and a half years. One of these days, an event we call the rapture, the dead in Christ, and the living believers will be changed into resurrected and glorified body. That's me and you and everyone that's living in the church age and those before. And we will call up to, to be with him, with the Lord. That resurrected body will never got, die again. Now let's stop right there just a quick second. That means there'll be no more cancer, there'll be no more diabetes, there'll be no more bad hearts, there'll be no more missing limbs. Not, none of that is going to take place. In heaven, when we get that resurrected body, you know, the the enemy tries to put things into people's minds. Well, if somebody's blown up into pieces, how can it happen? Don't sell Jesus Christ short. He said, I know where the sparrow falls. Jesus raised this young man from the dead for the sake of this lonely mother. So maybe there was no brother, other brother, no sisters, as I said earlier. He had compassion for this woman in her situation. So remember that when we go a trial or a test, Jesus has compassion for us. He just doesn't throw us out there and just leave us out there to see what we're going to do. He's forever with us. And so is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. He touched the casket in which the young man lay and spoke to him. He always used the same method in raising people from the dead. He spoke directly to them. And I believe that in some way or another, when the rapture takes place, if, if I die and go by the way of the grave, or if I go into rapture, he's going to know exactly who my name is. He doesn't need Google. He doesn't need search to find out where I'm at, what my name is. He's going to know all of that. Hallelujah. Scriptures tells us, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together. Not one at a time, and next week I'll take another one, and so on. We're all going to be raised together in a moment, and twinkling of an eye. To be together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. He's not going to touch this, touch this sinful earth right now. He's going to get his saints out of here. I will tell you right now, I don't mind telling you, I'm pre-trib. I don't need to go through no, no uh, uh, tribulation to prove myself to Jesus. I'm not exalting myself. Don't say, well, you don't need proof. The Bible clearly says right here that we're going to meet him in the air. He's not going to set foot on this earth. So many people get confused with the rapture and the resurrection. They are both the same event. The battle of Armageddon, he will come and put his feet on this earth. That is the difference. You'll find that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Let me repeat that. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. So I, I thank you so very much for joining in. The anointing, when the anointing takes place, that is the Holy Ghost speaking through me if I allow myself to submit myself to him. Let's end this in prayer. I think it's been a very good session. God, I know that prayer is far-reaching in its effects. I pray today for all the people in leadership positions all over the world that they will know and follow you as a divine leader and king. Amen. So not only do I pray for America, but I pray for the world to accept Jesus Christ. That's up to them. 
I also pray for my country. I pray for those in leadership right now. And in my opinion, this country needs it. God bless. We love you. Hope to meet again.